Good morning. Pastor Caleb and I want to welcome you uh, to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, last week we celebrated some of the things that uh, the folks at First Muncie are doing to help one another and to help their neighbors in our community. And I just want to say people are continuing to write letters, send cards, make phone calls, checking up on one another. Uh, people are continuing to make masks and uh, get them distributed to those who may need them. But other emails came in letting me know what people are doing. Some people are going out and picking up trash on the back roads, you know, getting their, themselves out and into nature. Other people are just being this, this soothing, comforting voice for those who are feeling anxious right now, someone to talk to. And I know that some people are also... Uh, adopting a senior high high school student, uh, sending them encouragement, sending them little gifts. And so I just want to say, great job. Continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ as we work our way through these times. And now, would you prepare your hearts to begin worship in the name of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us join together in our opening prayer. Gracious Lord, may our worship this morning be all about you. You know how easily distracted we can be. You know our minds tend to wander, thinking about our worries, what we will do this afternoon, even in the week to come. Help us to lay these thoughts aside during this time so that all of our hearts, minds, and souls can worship and exalt you with our songs, prayers, and affirmation of your word. Amen.
Please join with me in our prayer of illumination. O oh Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. From the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Within the church, one of the most beloved images of Jesus is that of the Good Shepherd. The good shepherd who watches over his flock, he, he protects them, he feeds them, he leads them, he nourishes them and keeps them from harm. Those who follow and believe in Christ, of course, are his flock, the ones he protects and leads. The image of the good shepherd is old and goes back into the Old Testament where God is likewise portrayed as a shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me to quiet waters. His rod and staff, they comfort me. Psalm 79, we are your people, the flock of your pasture. Psalm 95, the Lord is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. In Isaiah 40 verse 11, it describes the coming Messiah as one who will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs in his arms and carry them close to his heart and gently lead the mother with young. These pastoral images of God and the Messiah 
carry over into the New Testament with Jesus as the shepherd who in Matthew 18 and Luke 15 will risk his life to seek even just one sheep that has gone astray. The one who in Mark 6 will have pity on the people because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And who in 1 Peter is the shepherd and guardian of our souls. The images of Jesus as the good shepherd are so common to us that many times we take them for granted. Take this gentle Jesus who takes care of all of our needs for granted. However, in today's text, we see maybe a not so gentle Jesus who begins by saying that everyone who tries to get into the sheep bolt by any other means than the gate is a thief and a robber. Shepherds had many jobs, and defending against thieves was one of them, and it was a full-time job. Only the shepherd and the sheep were allowed to go into the fold, and the gatekeeper was the one who decided who got to go in and out. The gatekeeper would only allow and open the gate for the shepherd and those sheep that recognized his voice. Others call to the sheep, but they don't listen because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Those who sneak into the fold are only there to do harm, but the shepherd, he defends against them. Now, we get this metaphor, don't we? We understand it, and we aren't even sheep farmers. So imagine how simple it would have been for the people of Israel, many who made their living by raising sheep. The story is taking place in the land of Judea. And the main part of Judea is a plateau stretching from Bethel to Hebron. It's an area about 35 miles long and 16 miles wide. Now the ground in this area is mostly stony and, and rough, which made it conducive as a pastoral land rather than a farming land. And so, as you can guess, the image of a shepherd was very common in this area. Now, because of the terrain, there was little grass. And so, sheep would tend to wander off looking for a fresh, a fresh patch of grass to munch on. There are no protecting walls on the plateau. And on either side were steep slopes that had deep ravines and crevices, easy for a sheep to get lost in or trapped in. So the flocks were never allowed to graze without a shepherd. And the shepherd, he never got a lunch break. He was always on duty. The shepherd's job was constant and dangerous as he had to protect the sheep, not only from the dangerous terrain, but also from wild animals. And as we said, thieves, these images paint a picture of a shepherd who is always on guard. They're very protective. So when Jesus says that he is the good shepherd, we can say with confidence that we know what he's talking about. And if this imagery is easy for those of us who are pretty far removed from sheep to understand, then why was it so hard for those who lived every day in this area to understand? In John chapter 10, verse 8, it tells us that they did not understand what he was talking about. So Jesus tries again and he says, okay, forget the metaphor of, of the shepherd. Think of me as the gate. I am the gate, the one who lets the sheep in and out. The sheep come in by me and they are safe. They go out by me and they get fed. Get it? Everyone else who tries to get their attention, they only want to steal them or kill them. Me, I am the gate the sheep go through so that they can live and live abundantly. Now, some of you may be a little confused thinking, oh, wait a minute. First, Jesus was a shepherd that the gatekeeper had to allow in and out. And now he's the gate. I don't get it. Which is he, the shepherd or the gate? Well, maybe some insight into Middle Eastern shepherding will help. Judean shepherds did things differently than, than, and with different purposes than we do. 
In America, sheep are mostly raised for meat. But in Judea, the sheep were mostly kept for their wool. Therefore, in Judea, the sheep stayed with the shepherd for years. And instead of having dogs to help round up the sheep, the shepherd would use a sling and he would precisely drop a small stone right in front of their nose to get their attention and draw them back to the flock. He had a staff or club, often with a spike on the end of it in order to fend off wild animals and thieves. His rod, like a shepherd's crook, was used to catch and pull straying sheep back from danger. At the end of the day, the shepherd would stretch his rod across the gate close to the ground, and as the sheep went under it one by one, he was able to inspect them for injury. The shepherd knew his sheep very personally, and they knew the shepherd as well. They knew his voice, or sometimes the shepherds would play a little tune on a flute, and the sheep would, would come to him, but they never answered to a stranger because they didn't know the stranger's voice. H.V. Martin spent some time in Israel and remembers one morning seeing two shepherds uh, and their flocks getting ready to go out the pasture. The night before, the two shepherds kept their, their sheep in a cave near Bethlehem. And in the morning, one of them walked a good distance from the cave, and he began to sing in this, this strange, shrill, high voice. But all of his sheep went running to them. They knew his voice. Another difference between Middle Eastern shepherds and Western shepherds is that Middle Eastern shepherds don't drive their sheep from behind with a stick. Instead, they walk in front of them, leading them, making sure the path is safe and the sheep follow. In John 10, 3 and 4, Jesus said, He calls his sheep by name and he leads them out. He goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him. My Old Testament professor, Dr. David Dorsey, was leading a group of, of seminary students on a bus trip through the Holy Land one year, and he had just gotten done explaining the differences in these shepherding uh, ways when the bus stopped to allow a flock of sheep to cross the road. And to his horror, they were being driven from behind with a stick. And so he got off the bus astonished and he said to the man, I don't understand. I've always been told that over here, your shepherds, you lead from the front rather than driving from behind. And the old man gave a toothy grin and he said, you are right, my friend. But you see, I am not the shepherd. I am the butcher. Friends, the answer to the question, which is Jesus, is he the shepherd or the gate is yes. He's both. Jesus is giving different metaphors. He's speaking of two different types of sheepfolds. In the villages, there were larger folds with high walls um, in which the whole community would put their sheep in. And they were protected by a strong gate, which only the hired gatekeeper had a key to. But when the sheep were out in the hillsides, they were kept in smaller folds made of stone walls about four feet high. And there were no gates on these hillside folds. So at night, the shepherd would lay across the entrance so that the only way the sheep could get in or out was to walk over the shepherd. Thus, in a very literal sense, the shepherd was the gate and the only way in was through him. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever comes through me will be saved, and whoever goes out through me will find good, abundant pasture. To go in and out in safety was the biblical writer's way of describing a life that is safe and secure. In and out of your house, in and out of your, your town, in and out of your country. Psalm 121 says, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forever. Jesus said, follow me, listen to my voice, and I will protect your going out and your coming in. I will feed you and give you rest, and you will feel safe and secure. 
So we, we are the Lord's sheep. But as Isaiah says in chapter 53 of his book, when describing the suffering Messiah, we all like sheep have gone astray. Despite the shepherd's continuous calling and leading, we, like clueless sheep, tend to wander off. Now, when a sheep wanders off, you could, you could go after it with a stick and give it a few whacks across the back, or you could send a dog out to bite at its legs. But who of us is not more drawn by honey than vinegar, by love rather than being hit from behind? St. Augustine said that we are more likely to be moved toward Christ by delighting in truth, blessedness, justice, peace, rest, and hope. All good and positive reinforcing things. He said, show me a lover and I'll show you someone who knows what I'm talking about. Augustine also said, show a green branch to a sheep and it will follow after you. What delights and attracts us to follow Christ is his beauty, his truth, his gentleness, his goodness, his grace, his mercy, and his love. Friends, Jesus is the green branch who draws us to God. And through him, we are all meant to draw people to God as well. We're all meant to be green branches who through our godly living, are showing love, sharing the gospel and ministering to one another, draws others to God. Jesus is the good shepherd who calls, feeds, and protects his sheep. And when we wander, as we have done and are probably going to do again, the shepherd doesn't send out a dog of guilt to bite at our hind legs. He doesn't shame us with a stick to turn us back. Instead, he pulls out his spiritual sling and he throws a pebble of love just in front of our noses to draw our attention to his hand that is holding out an irresistible green branch of life, leading us back to the pasture of the heart of God. Friends, we know the shepherd's voice. We have heard it thousands of times, and we recognize it. And here's what it sounds like. In Philippians 4, 8, we're told, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, think on these things. My friends, these things are also the voice of the shepherd calling you and me to abundant life. So keep listening for that voice. When you hear it, trust it and follow it, and it will lead you home. Choose this day whom you will serve. Amen. Let us pray. O Great Spirit, there are many among us today who need your special presence and touch in their lives. We specifically pray for Ginny and Ardeen who are currently undergoing chemotherapy treatments and we ask your blessing upon them. Lord, there are those with physical ailments, emotional situations and relational problems. There are those who are anxious, even scared of losing their job, their, their businesses, even their marriages. There are those who are afraid of contracting the COVID virus or infecting somebody else. Lord, there are many who are lonely, depressed, and losing hope. And because we don't understand why these things come into our lives, we are tempted to question and complain. Lord, we pray that because our faith is being tested and some are being pushed to the limit, we pray for them and ourselves that our faith will not be diminished during these days, but rather strengthened. May we look back upon these days as the days that solidified our faith, helped us to walk closer to you, 
and cemented our feet upon the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we thank you for joining us for worship today. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you. Go forth in peace and lovingly serve one another as we seek to be a blessing to others. Amen. <laughs>